What does filmed for IMAX mean? It isn't just a movie that'll look great on IMAX's screens. It means that hiding from a sandstorm feels like fear in every flicker. And every triumph is felt in every sound wave. And the things we've only imagined, you can truly experience those too. That's what filmed for IMAX means. Get tickets to experience Dune Part 2 now and IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Age of Radio. A for screen and country special presentation. And now, 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 for something completely similar. <laughs> this is for screen and country. Baby, I am in the groove with that music. Mm. Yes, I can feel it. I could feel it inside. I could feel it up and down. The the spirit, Brendan, the spirit and the power of the king of England, old Chuck the Third, just just rushing through my veins, brother. Like like I shot him up in my arm, brother. That's what I'm feeling because it is a special episode, Brendan. It's a special time, and we are back. You uh. You you good, my dude? Sorry, I uh, I had a moment there. You, I, the music the music really did get to me. I, I see that uh, Wolfman Jack is now leaving your body, so that's good at least. <laughs> Bye, Wolfman. See you later, Jay. <laughs> Don't make sure to clap for me. He's gonna rate yeah. your record high. I've heard. If he you did clap for him. He did. If you go over to Discogs, my record's at five stars. I think that's the system they use, right? Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Animal noises and fart machines. Is that you? Yeah. Oh. That's me. One star. Oh. Out of one. But we're not here to promote my musical career, we're which not? is in flames. Oh. No. I mean, I could use the podcast for that purpose, but mm. I mean, if I'm going to promote myself on a podcast, I don't know if it's going to be this one. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I said it. Wow. Okay. Continue, please. No, I'm just going to sit here silently and stare at you. <laughs> I don't like this. J- okay, well, well, I, I couldn't do it anyways. It was clearly a lie on my part. I can't shut up for that long. No. you, uh, I, Jason, knowing you for that long, I, I don't recall the last time I've seen you uh, quiet for that long. I'm just kidding. You're a very somber, thoughtful person. Thank you, I think. See? <laughs> there we go. He did it again. See, he's he knows how to do it. Jason, what? What? Who? Who are we? What is this? We. Well, if you listen to the opening credits, you'd know that we are for Screen and Country. Oh. This is a special presentation of our podcast, which we like to do from time to time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is an old feature that we haven't uh, haven't done in a, a long time. Oh, a long time. It's time to talk about porno again. Nope. Uh, those are those are behind the paywall. Okay. Uh. Because really, how much can you say? It's like, well, he's he's thrusting, and he's he's still thrusting. He's kind of got a jackhammer thing going. It's kind of like the last scene we saw, really. Jason, you're really bad at promoting how great our behind the paywall content is. Look, if you want to be if you want to be lulled to sleep by two dummies talking about porn, give us money and we'll do it. I mean, it won't be my most uh, uh, finest. It won't be my finest hour, but sure, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> It just it, all this is an audio track. I'm just quietly like every now and then. Yeah, she's hot. Yeah. You just yeah, uh, disturbingly at some point here. <laughs> mm. Oh god! Oh, it's everywhere. Oh man! I'll be right back. You just hear like scrubbing. Anyway, this is horrible. Um, Jason, it is. It is. It's terrible. Your name is Jason, and your name is Brendan. That's right. And this podcast, like you said, is called For Screen. And country. And Jason, we talk about, well, we have been talking about war films. We've been talking about the 100 greatest war films ever made in wartime. No, not just in war. I guess every time is wartime. 
I mean, I, almost. It's, cynic, it, it, it's almost cynical to say, but yes, every, all time is wartime, all unfortunately. All time is wartime. That is my the most cynical thing I will say on this podcast. Um, I don't know why I said that kind of like with the cadence of Donald Trump. It's the most cynical thing I'll say on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> most cynical. You've never seen anything more cynical than what I said on that podcast. <laughs> In terms of podcast and cynicism. Um, but yes, we are talking about the 100 greatest war films of all time. However, like Jason said, this is a special presentation because we are going back to an old segment we like to call, and now for something completely similar. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of tied into the British movies we used to do, but it basically means we're going to, we're going to talk about a few movies kind of tangentially related to uh, the ones on the list, whether there be a sequel, another adaptation of the same source material, a prequel, um, even sometimes just another movie by the same director or with uh, similar themes. Sidequels. Sidequels, um, side quests, midquels. Uh, 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 spin-offs, spin-outs, yeah. spin-ups and spin-downs. PSAs, uh PDAs, uh, scooters, gypsies, uh, tramps, and queens. We could watch RoboCop because it's similar to um, whiskey galore. Whiskey galore, <laughs> and then and then we could watch WCW Capital Combat 1990 because RoboCop's there. Right, exactly. Those these are all things that are making sense to everyone listening. Absolutely. Um, yes, so- but but those those things are not what we're here to talk about today. We are here to talk about. A film that is actually a remake. It is a remake of the very first film a that we watched. A remake. No, the remake isn't. The re- it's a remake. It's, well, or is it a remake? I guess it's another adaptation. It's, another really. it's adaptation. not really a remake yeah. of the film, but it is another take on the Eric Maria Remark novel, A Quiet on the Western Front. This- and this. Go for it. I was just going to say, is this, how you're, is this your cadence for the whole entire episode? Yes, 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 yes. And this version comes to us from the year of our Lord, 1979. A glorious time for filmmaking and an even more glorious time for filmmaking on television. Mm, because the same year as All Quiet on the Western Front on television, uh, we also got Apocalypse Now. In the theaters. In the theaters. Which but we what will if not, it had been a TV movie? Which we will not elaborate on any further, Jason, because, spoiler alert, well, we'll we're going to talk about that movie one day. I always feel like Kurt's spreading, mm. working with you. <laughs> what, does that even, what does that even mean? You were an errand boy mm-hmm. sent on a mission to make a delivery. I don't remember what the line was, sure. but you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Gr- Great. Leave it all in. <laughs> um, so All Quiet on the Western Front, 1979. Just want to go through some of the people involved, and then Jason will... I, well, I mean, I don't think we're going through too much of the plot, because it's pretty similar. You might say completely similar to something we've covered before. Yeah. Um, so maybe we don't even have to go too much into it, but maybe just a refresher. But anyway, this movie stars uh, Richard Thomas as our man, Paul Bomber. Uh, and we'll get into some of these casting choices. Uh, Ernest yeah. Borgnine as Cat. Stanislaus Kat Kaczynski, uh, yep. Donald Pleasance as Kenterick, Ian Holm as Himmelstoss, Patricia Neal as Mrs. Bomber, and a host of others. There are a lot of other people, but those are the ones I'm going to mention because they're the ones that you guys mostly know. I'm sure this is probably a Star Trek actor Jason's going to mention here in a second. And the director, of course, is Mr. Delbert Mann. And Jason, uh, the one movie standout that I saw that he's directed is uh, the movie Marty with, uh, oh, oh, funny enough, Ernest Borgnine. Ernest Borgnine. Yeah, so there you go. I've never seen Marty. I want to see Marty because I love Ernie. Yeah, yeah, right. All of that, yeah, all of that adds up. I've never seen Marty either. It's just one of those movies where uh, I just know of its existence and not much more. Do you know why I know of its existence? I know of its, of its existence because of another movie. Do you know what that movie is? Uh, Rudy. Quiz Show. Oh. Because the, the question that he intentionally gets wrong is about what movie won the Academy Award. And I don't remember if Marty did or not, but he, I think he said Marty won and it didn't. Or he, or he didn't say Marty. Well, I don't know, but that's how I know what Marty is. Quick editor's note. Marty did win Best Picture. How dare you spoil a 30-year-old movie? A 30-year-old movie based on a historical incident. Yeah, you monster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christopher Nolan would not be happy with you. 
But don't spoil the past for me. Is, it, that's, is that your Christopher Nolan? Yeah, that's that's what he would say. Yo, I'm Christopher Nolan, film nerd. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't I don't mean my 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 various nerdy guys to sound like stereotypes, but it's just what it happens. Just happens. Yeah, it's just what happens. How much you can do. But Jason, I blame Hollywood. <laughs> Jason, we talked about uh, the 1930 All Quiet on the Western Front because I believe it we was did. the number one movie on the list. I'm gonna confirm that in a second, but I think yeah, that's what check. we did. Um, no, it's the number sixteen movie. I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah. But we did talk about. I think the 19- it was the earliest, was it not? It, it uh, yes, I believe so. So we did talk. We talked about the oldest movie on the top one hundred uh, greatest war films of all time, All Quiet on the Western Front, nineteen thirty. Lewis Milestone. We both said it was incredible. Um, Holds up. Amazing movie. But Jason, why don't you tell us? Uh, just kind of maybe a little refresher as we go into the nineteen seventy nine television movie of the same name. So yeah, just to recap, because the plot is very similar, it's all based on the novel. Uh, Paul is, Balmer is a young man among many who is being, you know, living and educated in Germany in the early part of the 20th century. And it's a time when German militarism is rising. The tensions in Europe are inflaming and war is imminent, apparently. And he and his friends get convinced, I guess, through... German propaganda and through his own teacher extolling the virtues of serving the fatherland to join up in the military and we see his experience in the uh, German infantry in World War One, and kind of follow it and um, experience what he experiences while flashing back to his life before the war and providing context and this movie does pretty much the same thing as the first one obviously there are differences it's like it's not a shot for shot remake or anything because obviously it's an adaptation of the same work and not a direct film remake but uh you know it does hit a lot of the same same beats mm-hmm. um this version is interesting because of the cast because of course the 1930 version stars a lot of people that while you and I have become familiar with some of them you know they're they're almost 100 years before us yeah. So it's not like we necessarily recognize it, but at this one, I mean, Ernest Borgnine, come on. He's in Total Recall, isn't he? <laughs> I don't think so, is he? No, doesn't he play a cab driver in Total Recall? I thought you were going to say he plays, uh, <laughs> what's Wait, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I, say fuck he, it, I'm... He plays the monster. <laughs> no, you know what, I'm thinking of Escape from New York, that's what I'm thinking of. Oh. I've only seen Escape from New York once, and it was a long time ago. A long mm. time ago. I like that movie. Um, yes, Ernest Borgnine, and we, and of course, like I said, Donald Pleasance and Ian Holm. Three. Uh, it's funny because like this this movie takes three big names, or at least big names to us. I I guess they were all recognizable in 1979. Maybe not Ian Holm, but um, it put puts them. Who all, knew? Put them all in this Who movie. Who knew, Brendan? But it's funny the way they like pepper them into just like significant roles, but not necessarily big roles. Can you imagine a movie with Mikhail, Blofeld, and fucking uh, 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 Bilbo together? Finally? I'm sorry, Mikhail? Yeah, he was in, he was Mikhail from Mikhail's Navy. Oh, okay. so, sorry. I think he was Mikhail. How, how I think he was at least on the show. How could I forget the... Cl- oh, oh, you're talking about the TV show. Okay, I was going to say, how could I forget that classic of cinema? <laughs> no, no, I think... Uh, who was Mikhail in that movie? Now i got to look up Mikhail's Navy, because I need to know. Of course, you need to know. Mikhail's cause... Navy. You can cut this if you want, no, but this I need is to gr- know. No, yeah, this yeah, is... so Ernie was fucking Mikhail, yeah. Well, he was fucking Mikhail. No, no, he was Mikhail. Oh. Maybe he's fucking himself. I don't know. I should watch that show. Well, Jason, we're not talking about Mikhail's Navy. We're talking about Quite the Western Front 1979. <laughs> we, we, if you're just tuning in for the first time, this happens a lot. Yeah, we we get we get sidetracked. Jason starts googling things. He starts uh, telling me about his uh, political beliefs and tells me to do my own research. It gets pretty crazy here, um, folks. What you need to understand is that Ernest Borgnine I discovered on The Simpsons when I was very young because he goes along with them on that camping trip. I think he fills in for somebody else's dad. This is what people need to understand. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. This is required. Context. This is required material. Well. Look, if you're going to understand my take on the movie, okay. you need to understand me and my tastes. Sure. And the and the foundations, Brendan, of those tastes. And one of those foundations is Ernie Borgnine showing up on The Simpsons. This is going to be a seven-hour episode this week as Jason <laughs> just rambles on about his entire childhood. 
Well, that's well, Brendan. Look, this is. I mean, there's only so much we could say about a remake of All Quiet on the Western Front. In uh, my younger uh, and more formative years, I remember a piece of advice my father gave me. <laughs> à la recherche de temps perdu. Yeah, that's the French version. Uh, Le beau Gatsby. Okay, <laughs> let's get into this. So yes, these three heavyweight actors: Ernest Borgnine, Ian Holm, and of course the other guy we mentioned. <laughs> Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance, thank you. Um, okay. So this movie, it's a TV movie version of All Quiet on the Western Front. I know you said it's not, um, it's not, tech- well, we'll say, we said it's not technically a remake. It's another adaptation no. of the source material. But I'll tell you this right now. If you told, if, if I didn't know about the book, I would just be like, yeah, it's just a remake of the original film. Because yeah. it is very, very similar in terms of like just the content. There's there's a few minor differences, but in terms of structure and stuff, in fact, it's about it's almost the same length. I think it's the, it's only about ten minutes difference between the two, right? Yeah. Um, the biggest difference with this one, obviously, the cast, but this one's in color. <laughs> it's unfortunately, a, and the that's color, it. So long, folks. Well, I was gonna say it's in color, which is nice, but unfortunately, the color it's in is brown. Now, Brendan, I'm a realist. I understand that World War One was probably an extremely brown war. But this this ga- this this fucking movie looks like a video game from 2008, babe. It's got the brownies. It's like Gears of War over here. It's like whoever heard of color? No, color's not for bad for bad boys. No, bad boys play cool video games that don't have a palette, babe. Wow, that was so much, Dennis. So much, Dennis. <laughs> um, when it when when I when, it, when I channel it, I want to let it out. So, you know? so you're saying it, it has a bit of a uh, uh, like a murky look to it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's just very brown. Yeah, I mean, that kind of worked for me in a way, honestly. Yeah. Like, I think if we're going from black and white, and the cinematography in the 1930 version is fantastic. Um, yes. The way they worked with the limited amount, like, you know, the limited shit that they had, and then yeah. and the fog, the use of fog, and, and the huge sweeping shots and the landscapes and everything, yeah. but... I mean, we are working within the confines of a TV movie, so we, there, yeah. there are certainly limitations. Although I will say, sure. at times, it looked like a film that went to theaters. Like there were there were some there was some impressive looking stuff every now and then. I mean, it was very like TV lighting. Like we need to make sure I, everything is visible. I don't know. I'm sure you'll tell me later what the budget is, but like the, I wonder I if this no was idea. a little more than your. I wonder if this was a little more than your average TV movie because I will say like the production for a TV movie is quite impressive. Like they have they go to live like full on bombed out ruins and stuff they film in. I believe they filmed in like another country, so maybe they had access to that. But they went to the the trouble of, you know, finding authentic places to film it, mm-hmm. and it it looks like it could have been World War One. I'll tell you this, Jason. I, but I I have no idea the budget. And there's no information on it. Yeah. <laughs> But like it's, I I think the issue is like the movie looks fine, but it's like it, it it's like I say it's overly brown and the cinematography is not particularly inspiring. But this no. is a TV movie, I understand, and you can only work with what you got. But I, I appreciate trying to take a unique approach to the same material, and that's I think ultimately what my overall issue is with this movie. And it's and it's and it's not I mean, we see plenty of bad remakes, and I don't want to say this is a bad remake because mm-hmm. we'll get to the end and we'll talk about that. But it's just it's so unnecessary. Yeah, I mean, when I watched All Quiet on the Western Front, knowing that it's in, it's had, I mean, we're gonna talk, we're gonna end up talking about two remakes of it. But yeah, there are many, there are quite a few different versions of it in one way or another even even whether it's called all quiet on the western front or not there have been many it's it's not that it's not that i don't think the same material could be adapted over and over absolutely but it's like if you're going to do it try to find a new take on it try to find a different way to do it like try to and and in in fact this doesn't really live up to the original film at all as far as cinematography goes like the iconic shots in that movie that stick in my head you know the fight in the graveyard when that fucking church blows up and the fucking trench when the car when the camera pulls like there's nothing in this one that mm-hmm. sticks in my head like that i feel like this is the one they show kids in school who don't want to watch a black and white movie yeah I, I, you know what? I had that exact thought. Yeah. Like, it's like, well, this would be fine for a classroom if they wanted a color version of this movie mm-hmm. that's probably not as excessively violent as I imagine the Netflix one will be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just wait for that. <laughs> yeah. I have seen that one before, and it is a, it is a lot. Um, yeah. Even, I don't even feel like this one is, this one's sometimes not even as visceral as the original one. No. It was the 1931. Because no. I remember in that one, do you remember that, that infamous shot where you just see the hand, the arms like hanging off the, the yeah. gate? 
Like, there's nothing yeah. in here that quite stri- that strikes quite as quite as effectively as that image. No. What, what I will say for the movie's benefit, they do have a good amount of like people available to play troopers. Like they, they, they really like. I mean, in the sense that they do give it some scale. Yeah, yeah. Like it doesn't just feel like it's five guys, you know, being shot around. It, like they actually have a bunch of people. It's just funny because um, the way I heard it at first, just like I will give this movie credit. There are people in it. There are people and in they it. act <laughs> and they act. <laughs> it um and and like I say, the the production design is not bad. They have equipment. Mm-hmm. It, it looks legit for the most part. Um, one of the actually, I'll just mention this now. It was in my notes, but it just came to mind. One of the little like things I really do like in this movie, as far as an artistic thing, is that in kind of in the in the middle of the movie, when we have a situation where we have all the old guard guys that have been there since kind of the start, like since Paul got there, and then you have the new guys coming in, that there's a clear differentiation on who's who based on their helmets. Yes, because you notice all the old old guard guys have the spiked pickle halb that they're wearing, and then all the new guys have the the regular old stall helms, the new new fangled ones. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I think their uniforms are newer too, like newer styling and obviously cleaner. Well, but, and uh, <laughs> I also feel like they may have they might have had a little more participation making this movie because I remember with the first movie, um, I mean, I think they get away with it being an anti-war movie mostly because it's from the German perspective. But mm. I feel like it still would have been a little difficult to get the most accurate stuff for that movie in 1930. But in 1979, I mean, yeah, you want to, yeah, anti-war, sure, whatever. Like you know. same time, you know, you could argue 1930. I mean, you had World War One vets that were involved in the making of this movie, and they were st- only a decade or so out from the war. Compare that to 1979. You definitely still have World War One vets alive, but they're all pretty old men at that point. Yeah. Like, um. I, one thing I want to point out as something that I really liked in this movie, and it's not something I thought would ever ca- catch my attention, but um, the, s- the score and how they sometimes don't use it. Like this, it's mm. kind of, because it's, when it starts out, it, they have this like kind of somber, kind of haunting score in the background, and it, it, it kind of right away puts, the f- puts over the fact that like, the, you know, this is not a good situation. And... But at the right times, it does duck out for considerable stretches of time. Like it, it does, um, it does know when to come in and when to go out. So I will say, for a TV movie, it's not overly scored. Like what was that that um, that Colin Firth movie we watched, Tumble Down, where I feel yeah. like the score was working into overtime. Like it was just always constantly going. And yeah, and I feel like that was a product of its era. This one, like until you mentioned it, I hadn't even thought about the music in this movie. But maybe that's I was be- struggling. Maybe like that's, maybe that's how it worked so well. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. It doesn't. Music in movies doesn't have to be memorable. It can be. I mean, look at a Marvel movie. That most of that music is pretty like generic in comparison to something with a bespoke score but um and that works fine but i also you know i'm a guy i like i like a theme man i like i come back to it i like a lawrence of arabia we come back to that i like a dune and come back to that a little reprise you know when i say dune brendan i mean 1984's dune uh, the real dune how dare you (laughs) (laughs) i know that uh i know that you um but i know you also appreciate in a war movie when the score knows when to stop absolutely and that i feel like i feel like i love silence here they do. Um, interesting way to introduce everyone in this movie, too, because uh, I, f- I feel like we didn't get this in the original, but there's a narration of, like, each character, <laughs> their kind of interests, and, like, where they're from. And just kind of like a little mini profile of everyone. Yeah. But you know what? Again, but kind I of feel a- like... Kind of appreciated, so because, again, some of these people are hard to tell apart. <laughs> Absolutely. I do appreciate it. But also I'm trying to think like I don't remember if, if I'm thinking of the novel where they do basically list who everybody is and, mm-hmm. you know, he's just talking about his friends and where they're from or because like but also I think the movie did point out some of that stuff because I remember the, the farmer guy, right? The guy who was really into nothing but cows. Yes. Yeah. And farming. Um let's let's talk about how the same the same issue uh that cropped up in the first one jason i don't think there's a single i don't think there's a single german person in this movie <laughs> no no and i i guess and it's funny maybe this is a tribute to the original but yeah they they don't go to the nobody really speaks in a german accent and i have which is probably for the best yeah and i have to i have to say i do i i like the performance of the lead guy richard thomas as paul bomber i think he's pretty good um he's got the see i, I you know what i got to argue with that i didn't really 
like him. I found, no? I mean, I don't think he's a bad actor from what I see. I just don't think he jived with this role. It didn't do it for you, me. And you're, oh, you're zero for two on Paul Bomber in these movies. You're still not yeah, sold Yeah, I wasn't on him. super hot on, yeah, so we'll see with, with the next one. Maybe that guy will finally do it. Uh, Ernie carries this movie for me. Ah, that's where we're going to differ. <laughs> because as much as he is charismatic and and certainly entertaining and he's giving a performance with a capital P um I feel like he's too much of like a cigar chomping American yank for this to really work for me I I think the biggest difference in this one versus the original is that the the character of Cat in the original one while he was definitely like a mentor to Paul and the boys there still was an aura of him like some maybe some darkness to him like because he was always known as the guy that could get shit too right Mm -hmm. they don't really go into that in this version he's more just like kind of the the dad of the unit yeah um so he doesn't really have that going for him but i mean i I guess it's just i'm won over by ernie borgnine's charisma i love the guy i mean yeah i I just think he's woefully miscast (laughs) I mean, yeah, I mean, there's probably better people you could have cast in the role. Yeah, I don't know if if New York Sound and despite the fact that they're, you know, they're not attempting to do accents or anything, it does feel a bit out of place to have Ernie in that role. But I also think that he does get some of the spirit of that character. Yeah. I mean, but again, it's just it's filtered through his uh, kind of New York existence. Well, that's the thing. I feel like every time he was like, you got to do it for the fatherland. I was like, okay, come (laughs) on. That's not funny. (laughs) Hey, kid, look, we're talking about the fatherland here. Aren't you a big fan of the Kaiser? (laughs) Ah, that's interesting. We we do see the Kaiser in this movie. We did in the first one, too. Oh, did we? Yeah, there was the same. It's been a while. The the scene that you're talking about also occurs in the the original as well. Okay. And they did. I do appreciate. They do Sorry, keep up the accuracy of his his arm not being fully functional. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah you could see he kind of had it jammed in the saber, and he would and he would put out, out with one hand, and somebody else would grab the lapel, and he could pin the cross on. Mm-hmm. Jason, I think overall, at the end of the day, when we get to the when we get to the bottom of this movie, I think I'm gonna be a little higher on it, but I am gonna th- than you are, but I am gonna say um, the one of the things that I think one of the big changes they make here. And I think maybe slightly for the worse is um, Donald Pleasance's kind of sleepy performance. Hmm. Because I mean, I like Donald Pleasance. I think he's fine. But yeah, his the character is much less. He's a, almost flippant a little bit. Like he's he needs whereas, to be. He needs to be like like inspiring, blind, inspiring, but also blindly patriotic. No, like, no, like the sort of yeah. He doesn't come off as condescendingly patriotic, I guess, as the other guy, like where, or not even condescending, maybe that's not the right word, but where it's like he comes back and in this one, Donald Pleasance has like a cigarette and offers him a cigarette and it's kind of like, (laughs) but in the original, I felt like it was more uh, like, boy, you're serving the fatherland. I'm so proud of you. Like really just laying it on. And the guy's like, come on, man. Well, that's what I mean. That's that's what I mean. I I don't mean like, sorry, I, I, (laughs) you, 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 um, when you started talking, I didn't mean he was an inspiring character. I mean he's in, uh, inspiring patriotism and fervent yeah. like, like nationalism in these boys. Like that's what I felt like in the original. Is like I really bought it that this teacher had the ability to come in and whip them into shape. And again, I'm going. I'll go back again to that scene in Napoleon where I just don't buy it that Napoleon in that movie was able to talk those troops into into turning around and joining his side and it's just because the way the scene and maybe the way joaquin played it but that's the thing here too it's just the way Mm. they have donald pleasance play it and then really when the kid when the guys get outside that's when they start like whip it they almost like whip each other into into shape and that takes away from the whole scene because the whole point of this bit is that the teacher is the one that gets them amped because that's why paul bomber comes back later like rage you know full of rage at this teacher but it doesn't work as well when you know he he whips them up into a frenzy a little bit but then paul bomber really gets them going outside like that's not it's not as effective that way yeah i mean like i like in the in the other one it's like the the teacher passive aggressively shaming people for not joining the military and and giving these like Rah, rah, fire and brimstone patriotic speeches about the German culture and, and the uh, progress in science. Yeah. We're the, we're the superior culture. And it's interesting listening to that because it's like, oh, that sounds a lot like today. <laughs> the way we think of ourselves here in the West. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, when we get to the, the scene later on, when Paul comes back 
and talks with uh, Donald Pleasance with um, Kantarek. Did in the original film wh- weren't the wasn't the class there and didn't they like shame him? Like wasn't the whole thing where he came back and the, and uh, Donald Pleasance? Oh, no, obviously not Donald Pleasance in the original, but like the teachers, mm-hmm. the teacher had another class there. Yeah, and Paul yeah. came, he in. came in into the class. Yeah, yeah, and they and they and they called him a coward and everything because he was yeah. saying, "Oh, war is hell. It's not good. Don't sign up." And and they were getting all mad. The teacher was getting all mad. Yeah. He kicked him out. In this one, he just kind of goes back in and just tells them, like, like you know, passive aggressively, "Yeah, it's great. I love it. You're you're a real jerk." And it doesn't it doesn't have the same emotional. Yeah, beat. he goes there to flatly tell them, "It's like, well, I'm alive and this guy's alive, but everybody else is dead." Yeah, it's like it, it does. It doesn't work as well because you don't see this like class of essentially new recruits that Donald Pleasance would have had in his classroom. I will say that when, when they they do this, they do another thing that the original movie does really well in that when you start to see the newer soldiers come in over the course of the movie, they do clearly get younger. <laughs> they, I mean, at this point, like he's we have a scene near the end where Paul's walking along the trench line. And like patting each guy on the back, and it turns they're literally like thirteen year old boys. Yeah, like they, I'm sure they cast actual like teenage boys to be in those uniforms. What, uh, what was that? What, the patting on the back is that literally just to make sure they're alive? I think he's just yeah, probably just checking to see if they're ready. Kind of a reassuring pat as an older soldier, you know, being like, okay, boys, get ready. You know, I'm here with you. I think he took that from Cat. I think he's trying to be to those new young soldiers like Cat was to him, mm-hmm. to be like not a commanding officer type character, but like a father figure who's like, guys, everything you learned in boot camp is bullshit. We got to teach you how it actually works out here. Follow me, stick with me. We'll get through this. You know. Would the uh, would the Canadian version be a boot camp? Am I gonna have to? You're, oh, it's your week to edit. You can insert the laughter if you need be. Oh, 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 stop! Oh, you're too much. No, I'm not doing that. I'm lazy. <laughs> um, okay, and the, the I want, like I said, I wanted to talk about the three big per- performers, big names. We got to talk about Himmelstos, Himmelstos, yes, which I think is the most successful of the three in terms of performance. One hundred percent. I think Ian Holmes' casting as Himmelstoss is absolutely perfect, and I think it's a shame it was kind of wasted on a TV movie because I would love to have seen a bigger version of this movie with him in this role. I think he he f- way better than the original one gives the character of Himmelstoss more credit more pathos like because we do actually see a scene with him as a mailman and getting kind of fucked with by the boys well that's what i mean because i think in the original we see like a sweeter side of him first and and, as a mailman where he's like kind of nice to everyone yeah and he's just like the grumbly mailman and he's kind of a dick back home but it's like they're always fucking with him so no wonder he's a dick well well in but in the original he's not really that much of a dick until he gets to the military yeah whereas in this one um, they give him shit right off the bat, and it makes me because in the original, I'm like feeling like, well, he's getting what he deserves. He's an asshole, or he's getting. Sorry, I should say in the original, I'm saying it's a complicated thing because he yeah. starts out. Um, you're like clearly this isn't like his real personality because we see him at, at home and he's a, he's a very like you know easy to get along with guy. In this one, it's like oh they they just they just kind of want you to h- dislike him right from the get go. Yeah, where. I kind of yeah, still but, feel bad for him because the first thing yeah. we see is the kids being shitty to him at home. Okay, so uh, rap with me here, bud. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we look at Hemmelstoss as a character in the uh, 1930 film. Yeah. He is kind of the nice, weird mailman guy. Yeah. He, They all get to the army. Mm-hmm. He is going to be their drill sergeant, and he's a real dick about it. Yeah. He drives them, he's terrible to them, he treats them like shit, and they eventually get some revenge on him, uh, similar to how they do in this movie. And then, at some point, he goes too far with some other soldiers and gets sent to the front. And in the 1930 movie, he gets sent out uh, with the troops, he cowardly hides, and then he gets killed, uh, like the dog that he is. Mm Mm-hmm. This movie's different. This movie gives Himmelstoss way more credit. Because one of the things I argued during the last one is that Himmelstoss is... um, kind of appearance especially through the novel is colored by who's telling it and in the novel it's Paul right so through Paul's eyes this guy's a fucking monster but when you actually see what's going on he's really not that much of a monster he's basically a a drill sergeant who 
wants to work these guys hard because he knows them. He's got maybe a little bit of resentment against him. Uh, I think where it starts to go bad is when he when he does that bit where he in this one where he takes Paul and he makes him walk up the stairs and he keeps stepping on his bare feet, like with his boot. I've like he starts to, that. That's when he starts to cross over from like hard ass sergeant into starting to be like fuck, just a fucking like uh, sadomasochist or just inflicting pain. You know. See, like I feel they made him more of a one dimension. I mean, and not to go, go nothing to do with Ian Holmes' performance, which I think is great. Mm. But I th- I thought I think this one he's more of a more of a straight up villain than he was in the original because I think well, in the original they at least show that he's not always an asshole. <laughs> Whereas, no, but. I was going to say, though, but this, this, yes, up to this point, I would agree with you. But I think this character then gets redeemed because not only does this character, uh, uh, like, he doesn't cowardly die in battle. He goes out and fucking fights. He's, he does cower. Yeah. But then he gets up and goes out and fights and he gets an iron cross pinned on his chest by the Kaiser. And that's, you know, I mean, I know they were handed at iron crosses like candy, but to get the actual Kaiser to pin it on your chest, like, that's a big deal. And then at the end of the movie, we do learn that he died in combat, but he didn't die a coward. He died, a, you know, he died like any other soldier. Like, he died well, well as far, if you could say as that. As far about as something. we know. As far as we know. Like, it, the movie doesn't go out of its way to tell us he died like a coward. Like, he does in the 1930 version and in the novel, I believe. So, I like, I don't know if this was an Ian Holm thing. I don't know if this was a script thing to make the movie more palatable. But I do like that Himmelstoss gets a little more credit in this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he's not just this mailman who goes psycho and then dies like a coward. Like, uh, which is, that's fun. Well, uh, like I said, this is Ian Holm to me of the three big name actors in this movie is, I think, the most... A, a successful yeah. one. He, I, I think I may have even pictured Ian Holm in my head when I was reading the novel because I think this is the perfect role for him because he's so, Ian Holm has proven himself so great at playing guys with little man syndrome mm-hmm. and that's exactly the energy that this role needs Wait, and it has. Do you mean little man syndrome like the hit Wayans Brothers movie, Little Man? Uh, uh, no, I'm talking about the, the disease uh, that uh, was diagnosed to little man Carter. A a North uh, Kentucky um, ventriloquist, but also a person of small size. Wow, you made me hate a person just by description alone. A North Kentucky ventriloquist. Yeah, no, there's uh, there's not a lot of them. So is he Jeff Dunham? Obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Jeff Dunham's from Kentucky. I don't know. He has that vibe. <laughs> I've got a I've got a forty nine out of fifty chance he's not from Kentucky. Yeah, he's probably not from Kentucky. Um, wow, you're just ruling out other countries. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> He's American. Let's be real. Only an American would have Ahmed the Dead Terrorist as a puppet. Oh, boy. Don't even get me started. <laughs> Jason. On a stick. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of VO in this movie, Jason. What do you, both, what do you think about that? I, it's, it's, the, it's a device in the novel. It's a device in the 1930 movie. I mean, it's fine. I think it's more. Yeah. I think they use it more in this movie, I feel like. You think so? I think so. I mean, I maybe I just recognize some of the passages from what I read of the book, mm-hmm. uh, but it felt like it felt reasonable for this story. I mean, and like you say, especially maybe with an audience in 1979, maybe you need to be a little clearer about what's going on. I'm just... I mean, you ha- what you have to remember about the 70s, Brendan, is that everybody smoked, everybody drank, and there was lead in the gas. So everybody was fucking out of their minds. So you needed to be real straightforward with stuff if you wanted to make some money at the television box office. I just figured you were upset because you were like, you had enough of Richard Thomas. You're like, get off my get. I, not only do you have to watch your stupid face, but I have to hear your stupid voice. <laughs> Even when your stupid face is not on my stupid screen. Yeah. I'm assuming that's what you said. Yeah. yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. Wait, was that, are you doing Rain Man? What's going on? I I, I I don't know. I don't know anymore. I don't I don't think we could do that anymore. <laughs> no, we probably shouldn't. <laughs> We're not Shane Gillis on Saturday Night Live, babe. We can't pull that off. Wow. And I'm sure he's pissed people off too. Um I, I, he's particularly good at that. Yeah. Is that a skill? Intentionally or not. <laughs> I was gonna say, is that a skill? Okay, let's move on. Uh okay, so yeah, like I said, a lot of the scenes, a lot of the scenes are similar. Like the big scenes pop up. Like we get Bomber and that soldier that he uh, is slowly dies beside him on the yeah. hill. Um, we have and, the scene. Oh. We have the scene with the French ladies. Um, although yes. this one more heavily implies that they all had sex. Yes. Oh, pretty. It's pretty darn clear, short of showing them thrusting in each other. I mean, that would have been wild. <laughs> 
It's good to... Brendan, whenever two people leave a room, yeah. at any point, I assume they're going to have sex. No matter where I am, no matter what's happening, if two people leave a room together, in my head, they're going to have sex. Anytime, in real life or movies. Anytime, anywhere, if two people are in a room with me and they leave that room together, in my head, they're fucking. Okay, so, all right, I've got so many follow-up questions for you. <laughs> no follow-ups. <laughs> So if you see two people who just happen to be going to the bathroom at the same time in a restaurant, yeah, they're fucking mm -hmm. absolutely one hundred percent. Okay, and you're, mm. you're does it apply to animals as well? Oh yeah, animals. So if uh, you vegetable mineral, so so your mom goes to take the dog outside. You're assuming mm -hmm. your mom is fucking the dog. I mean, it, I have to. I have to assume that. You want to just go double check with her now and just get an answer? You want to give her a call? I'd and... rather not know for sure. Oh. <laughs> okay, you want to keep it a mystery? Yeah. Does that, does that yeah. kill it for you if you, if you find it? Spice of life, you know. <laughs> Good Lord. Mystery, they say, is the spice of life. That's what I've heard. The the pickup artist? Mystery? Yes. He, without him, life is nothing. <laughs> but yes, it's, it's, these, these, these key scenes are pretty similarly done. Um I guess the only other thing, there's two other things I want to mention, just kind of overall things um, that I that I did really like. In the original movie, they make a big deal, and in this movie too, they make a big deal out of Bomber. Every time he's offered a cigarette, he says, no, I don't smoke. Um, I like how in this movie, they wait until the very last scene for him to actually have a cigarette. Yeah. It, it makes it a little bit more impactful, where in the, as in the original, he was just like, eh, eventually war shitty, and I just started smoking. But like in this one, they wait till he's at his very lowest. Like Everyone around him has died. Cat's, die, cat's dead. All of his friends are dead. And he's having like that cigarette in the, in the, um, in the trench. I, you know what, Brendan? I think if I was making this movie, I would have gone a little further. He would have had the cigarette, but he also would have had a chew uh, some chewing tobacco. He would have had like a bandit jammed in his lip, a uh, nicotine patch on, um, also with a, a pipe in one hand and a cigar in the other and a, and a cigarette in his mouth. So you would have you would have anachronisms uh, and just have him wearing a nicotine patch in 1917? You don't know that there weren't nicotine patches in the Audis in the 10s? Oh, well, we're going to find out right now, Jason. Mm, I wouldn't do that. Entertain the people. Well, uh, you know, like I, I don't think you need to fact check me, you Brendan. So? You know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty solid on this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you would have to not trust me like that. I, I don't think that's very cool for a friend to do to another friend. Oh no, you, you don't. Okay, well, I just want to tell you that it, it wasn't until the late '80s, so you're very wrong. <laughs> Look, uh, sometimes time is a flat circle, and things are difficult to discern. Would you say that the past is a foreign country? Yeah, they do things differently there. Okay. Um, and then the other big thing, uh, of course, the, the ending is a little bit different. Uh, just a slightly yeah. bit different. Because, and what I really like in this movie is early on when he's in the class and Donald Pleasance is teaching, he's drawing a picture of a bird that's outside in the window. And he's just kind of his escape from the conversation that's going on, right? And then at the end of the movie, what is he doing? He's drawing a picture of a bird to kind of escape from the moment that he's in. And ultimately, that's when he gets killed. He <laughs> gets him killed. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's what happens in the original. It's with, uh, although it's with a butterfly, right? Yeah. But I think I think they don't set it up like this one does. Like I think they, I think it's set up fairly well. Like where they where it, it like I said, it literally symbolizes his escape from the conversation in the class. And whereas now yeah. it's it's his escape from you know it's him trying to think of anything but the situation that he's currently in. And like and like that bird, he was now free. Yeah, free as a bird. Because death, death, Brendan, is the ultimate freedom <laughs> from life. Death is just another word for nothing I have to do. Death. Na -na 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 -na. To paraphrase Alex Jones, life is death. I don't like you doing that. I do. I, I don't even want to paraphrase him, Jason. Hey, Brendan, I got. I wanted to tell you something. Uh, you could cut this if you want. If not, the people are welcome to listen in. Okay. You know how bad the world is. Tell me. I was on YouTube and a video of Richard Nixon from 1990, whatever. Before, I assume before 1994, because that's when he died. Mm. Pops up, and he's he's looking like a boss with his hair kind of askew, very old. And he goes on and talks for about two minutes about Russia in the future and what could happen if democracy went away. And he's pretty on the money. 
Scary stuff. Skip when when Richard Nixon is talking sense from beyond the grave. Yes, scary stuff, my friend. Well, now that Jason has terrified all of you, um, shall we take a break, Jason? Oh, I think we need to. Okay, well, we're going to take a brief break, and we will be right back. Hey, friends, it's Dick Nixon. Yes, you heard that I was dead, but I've been saying stuff from beyond the grave, and the best thing from beyond the grave that I want to talk about for Screen and Country, which is on the Age Radio Network. Oh, you got to love it. You got to check it out because old Dick Nixon told you. Tell them Dickie sent you. Age of Radio. (laughs) We do not endorse Mr. Nixon's policies. Jason. Jason. Yeah. Be quiet. Why? All quiet. As we walk along the western front, dun, 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 you should be real quiet. As we walk along the western front, all quiet on the western front. Because it's time, it's time for bits and bombs. As we're being quiet on the western front, so quiet. We're so fucking quiet. We're quiet. All quiet on the western front, bits and bombs, baby. Yeah. Back to you, Jason. Ciao. Thank you, Brendan. You're welcome. First, thank you. My first note reads, a lady? We have a lady in this movie, Brendan. I don't think we discussed her much. Oh, Uh, you were just going to leave it there? (laughs) And my next note. Well, it's a war movie. It's, it's, you know, it's it's a a thing for us to see a war movie from this, especially from this era, where a lady gets a, um, uh, not only a credit, a starring credit. Well, are you referring to Mrs. Bomber? Uh, Mrs. Yeah, Mrs. Bomber's mother. Are you referring to Paul Bomber's <laughs> mother? Yes. Yes. Uh, the actress's name, of course, Patricia is... Neal. That's right, Patricia Neal. Mm-hmm. Doing a great job in her s- small amount of screen time, much like the original film. Uh, not a whole lot of screen time, but she, you know, she's she does the trick. She's fine. No, I like um, I like that role because uh, yeah, she he comes home to her um, during his his kind of leave and um, and she's obviously not doing well, but that's, it's a good performance. It's a it's she doesn't overdo the uh, oh I am the dying mother, you know. She just it's right right amount right amount of stuff. I'll give Paul credit. I do like that scene of him coming home and standing in the stairway there and just kind of standing there. Mm. And his sister being like, "Come on up, Paul, or come on in, you know, come see mother or whatever." And he's just. He's again, and we'll see it later, but he's having his hurt locker moment of staring at the fucking cereal. Like he just, him standing in his own house in that uniform. I bet you he's partially marveling at how small it feels. I mean, you keep building up that, that fucking cereal scene. That better be something else when we get to that movie. <laughs> it's like the first five minutes of the movie. Okay, good, because I ain't waiting a long time for it. <laughs> but I do like that. I Like I say, I'm not a huge fan of his performance, but I think he's doing the best he can. Maybe the maybe the role is just tough. I, I want who do you know who plays him in the um, Netflix version? It's a German actor because the the Netflix version is an all is a German production. Yes, that's wonderful, but it's not. I assume it's not because I want to say it's Daniel Bruhl, no. but I think he's probably a little too old. Now no, to play. no, no. The the oh. that entire movie, I'm pretty sure, is a cast of people. We, uh, I don't think either of us. No. Okay. I don't think. That's fine. Oh, look at that! Never mind. I'm wrong. It's um. Uh, Sylvester Stallone, apparently. Oh, hey, oh, uh, I heard there's a war going on. <laughs> <laughs> he just, like, wanders by. <laughs> oh, there's a war going on. I was hoping I could help out. Hey, Sergeant, when do we get to have fun around here? <laughs> oh, you know what, though? Hey, it's uh, funny. You you, <laughs> said, you said that uh, semi-seriously, but Daniel Brühl is in the movie, though. <laughs> oh, okay. Who does he play? Uh, Matthias. Oh, I don't okay. remember. It's been a long time. Is that the farmer, maybe? I don't well, know. We'll talk about it one day. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that uh, Ernest is the first guy we see. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote, don't like the narrator. I guess I don't like the guy's reading of the narration very much. I thought it was, we. I thought, okay, because the whole movie is in English, right? I mean, whatever. Yes. Let's get fine, whatever. But it is weird when Donald Pleasance is speaking, <laughs> like, English with, like, the German writing on the chalkboard. Like, that was, that yeah, was strange yeah. to me, because it's like, well, why not just fucking have them speak German? <laughs> 
Because it's well, then they'd have to shoot the whole thing in German, and good luck finding a bunch of actors in Hollywood in 1979 that spoke fluent German. It, it's just it's just strange because it the, the chalkboard writing just makes it stranger. Like if it if it didn't if it didn't have that, I guess it wouldn't have been as off putting. But but you know you know what Americans are like. No, I don't. What are they like? And us by proxy that we're all we're all dumb and we need we, we don't like subtitles, which is funny because it's funny in 2024. Subtitles, everybody uses subtitles now. Everybody, so many people I know watch TV with subtitles, my wife included, you included. I do. Absolutely. Not comedies. No. Well, you don't want to ruin the joke. Right. Well, that's the same thing with dramas, though. I don't want to ruin the joke. <laughs> hey, she's got cancer. Oh, Jesus. I was just like, oh, no. I don't want to know. I don't know, I don't know which one Sophie chooses. I got to turn these off. <laughs> Props to the effects department again. Um, some great, like nice wide shots of battle, like when the when the Germans are running at the French lines. We see guys running across the field. Some of the shots you could see a biplane coming over uh, the field, and then there's one really cool shot where we're looking down on the battlefield and we see the shadow of the biplane come over the troops. And I thought that was really nice, really well done. You know, I like the shadow of the biplane, but Nosferatu was ultimately better. Yeah, I understand that. He was a much better uh, airplane. Mm. Uh, Max Schreck was a very good airplane. <laughs> you were a good plane, uh, to paraphrase a line from the hit film Monster Trucks. Yes. And that then that first battle scene too, Brendan, I got to say, really good job at depicting the futility of this war, of having the, the, you know, the French charge their lines, the machine guns open up, cut down a bunch of French troops, a bunch of them get caught in the barbed wire. They start retreating. The Germans come up. They press their attack. They go over. Same fucking thing happens. The machine guns suppress them. They fucking, they get caught on the barbed wire and then they retreat. Like, it's just, that's how that war was fought a lot of times. Just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know what they added to this movie? I just remembered now that they didn't have in the original. I think we we mentioned it last time because it was in the book. But we do yeah. actually have a scene depicting them shooting their own horses. Yes, that's right. Because that guy is like screaming at them, like shoot the, like, I don't know if he said don't shoot the horse or if he's screaming to shoot the horse. I think horse. he's screaming not to because it's so, obviously it's horrifying. See, I thought he was screaming to, like, to shoot the horse because the horse was going to die in pain oh, burning or something. Maybe, and maybe. then finally the guy goes over and he's like, why do they have to kill horses? Yeah, it's, it's, it's intense. It's a, pretty, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty intense, sad moment of this movie. Yeah. I'm glad they included it because that, that did feel missing from the last one. With much different tone than later on when they start killing rats for fun. I, I wouldn't. Well, yes, it's a way to pass the time and for fun, but it's it's a, there's a practical reason to do it too because they they're fucking everywhere, and that was one of the great banes of the trenches was the rats that were everywhere. Mm. I mean, but I mean, no, I'm talking about the, just the the tone of the movie got a little goofy though when they were killing. Oh rats. yeah. Well, again, they're all kind of half crazy at that point, and this is something they need to do, and it's like it's how they have fun. <laughs> it's how they occupy themselves uh, to you know ignore the fact that they're being shelled constantly and and just. Having their nerves rattled at every minute of the day. Jason, at some point they put on gas masks because they're like, mm -hmm. oh, ga there's gas. They're using gas. Yeah. Weren't, isn't it famously in World War One they were completely ineffective? Is that right? Or, no. No? No, they did work. Like, as, as the war went on, the gas mask got better because originally the a gas mask was basically piss on a rag and put it over your face. Uh, was how you how you dealt with it, and then you know they weren't great, but they were better than nothing. See, that's what and I they do. Did save that's lives. what I do for people when I fart. I piss on a rag and tell yeah. them to hold it to their face so they don't have to smell my farts. And people look at me weird. I I tell you, <laughs> well, obviously, I tell you though, Brendan. There's a, a scene in this movie that I don't remember there being a uh, an amalgam in the other movie, mm -hmm. um, where yeah, it's after the gas attack. And, you know, Ernie takes his mask off and they all take their masks off. And the young, the new recruit drops his mask down in the shell hole and he goes down to get it. And they're like, no. And then he, they fucking put their mask back on and go down to grab him because the gas had settled down into the hole. Right. So he was basically dead. And, but they pull him out and he's pretty much dead to the point where where uh, Kat's going to shoot him. Mm -hmm. He gets his gun ready and then some corpsmen show up and, and take the body or take the guy away but he if he's living it's not a good life ahead of him unfortunately who's right whoever wins yeah i feel like that's and that's also, also the same line yeah fun trivia brendan don't know if you know maybe we've talked about this before but uh, uh mustard gas which was one of the the big gases they used would rise right would rise in the air and so it'd get blown around but 
so later in the war, they started using a gas called phosgene. And phosgene was great because phosgene was heavier than air. So it would sink down into the holes. Mm. And that's why that happened. Because so guys like that would jump in holes for, uh, you know, cover. And then they just fucking get gassed. Uh, interesting you describe it as great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as a as a as a method of using gas, I guess it's pretty great. Mm. I'm not saying we should use gas warfare because it's a pretty fucking terrible method of and mostly ineffective, you, really. You, method of warfare. You you mean we should just use it on our day to day lives? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think uh, firing a mustard gas shell or two at at the McDonald's because it got your order wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, it's. I mean, would it have that much effect though? Because I mean, ultimately, it was a weapon at some point, and now it's just a delicious condiment. So I mean, that's true. Times they are change. changing, Jason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Soldiers are more. I notice this when the when the soldier when there is a very effective scene. I think when Bomber has to tell the mother of another soldier what happened to Kemmerich. Yes. Yeah. I think that scene plays really well, and I think that's maybe Richard Thomas's best acting in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. But he because she keeps telling him like, "Don't lie to me. Be honest mm-hmm. with me." And he never is. He says, "No, he didn't suffer." But you know, obviously, he suffered. He said, "Nope, he didn't suffer. He didn't suffer." And then it's interesting later on when they get to a scene where um, you know Bomber tries to find out what happened to one of his other buddies, and the soldiers tell him. Like you give him a grim look and he says, oh, when did it happen? You know, they say a week ago. Was it quick? And immediately they're like, no, it took hours. It was very slow. So it's just interesting right away. The movie is like showing how honest they are with each other as opposed to like when they have to tell loved ones. Obviously, they're sugarcoating it. Oh, yeah. Well, your son, well, he got shot in the gut by a German machine gun and he laid out there for six hours. And we heard him scream most of the time. He did scream for mom. Um, I mean, you don't have to get that detail. And then he eventually just bled out, and we heard we heard his death rattle, and that was that, man. And let me tell you, Miss, you raised. And then a, the rats got to him. You you raised a hell of a stinky poo because when he died, <laughs> his farts were stanky. I mean, he he did release his bowels immediately, ma'am. Just so you know, did, I, I I saved you them in case you wanted to memorialize. <laughs> it's the last remaining thing of your son. Jason. You just wait till the next one. That happens. The next one, yeah, the sequel. <laughs> Not quiet on the Western Front anymore is the sequel. Actually, it's funny. There is a sequel. There is, and we will eventually talk about it, and uh, it's got some icky, icky, icky stuff behind it, so. Oh, yeah. fun. Yeah. There's a really good effect scene where they blow up a trench. Uh, Paul's, like, it's, it's basically talking about, like, you know, that it, you know anybody can go at any point and he's like walking away from this trench and he hears the shelling coming and he d- jumps out of the way and the whole fucking trench explodes i don't know if that was a composite shot or if they just blew that fucking trench up with him there but it was it was a nice explosion i really i really appreciate it i really like the detail of the french troops that are like using the machine guns and they've got like the they're not they're actually air cooled looking machine guns and the guys actually physically pouring water onto the machine gun as they're firing it to cool it off mm-hmm. I thought that was a nice detail because they eventually they would. I know the British had water cooled machine guns, just the really big barrels that were full of water to keep them from overheating. Yes. Um, oh man, the while there wasn't any scene quite as brutal as the trench uh, scene in the original. I mean, Ernie did go ham with a shovel in one scene, just fucking going to town on a guy after he'd explained to uh, uh, you know a new recruit like hey, throw that fucking knife away you're gonna get they're gonna fucking they'll kill you with that notched knife you need to take your shovel in fact it's way better yeah if you <laughs> hit killing it in people certain, in the trenches hurt, if you hit it in a certain spot you'll take their head off etc yeah I thought that I thought that hand-to-hand combat scene was pretty intense actually yep and again, that's a. I think that's a detail that's in the first movie, a detail that uh, it was in the book, that those, and I've heard that too, those bayonets, they used to issue those bayonets with a saw on the back, but Allied troops were really fucking pissed about it because they're a pretty brutal weapon when you use that saw as a bayonet. So they used to, they were not nice to people that they caught them with. So they stopped, you know, they didn't take them with them. Yeah. You had to be real careful in those days. You didn't want to piss off the enemy too much. Yeah, you just want to kill him. You don't want to make him mad. You just want to kill him. You don't want to torture him. And if you start torturing them, then they're probably going to torture you back. Mm-hmm. It's vis-a-vis, you know? Uh, I think I think the whole shell hole with the Frenchman scene in this movie is a wash. I don't think it works nearly as well as the first movie, and it has none of the impact. And I don't know if that's... Well, I, I don't find that the, the actual guy that's dying in there is given much to do beyond yeah. die. Um, not like the dude in the original film and... 
yeah, it just it doesn't doesn't work. I feel bad in a way because it's 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 almost unfair to compare this movie to the 1930 I original. I mean, again, different limitations. It is a television movie. It, it's like c- comparing this movie, which I mean, spoiler alert, I think is pretty good, to a movie that is like a fucking unadulterated classic. I know, and that's and that's the trouble with remaking a movie like this is that unfortunately you can't escape that comparison. Yeah. it's just it's going to happen, and but it's like. The scale of this movie, the budget of this movie, to me, has nothing to do with the acting. And it, and and I don't know. The scene just doesn't, whether it wasn't directed properly, whether the actors just didn't get, I don't know. It just didn't feel, didn't have the same punch. And well, you've never, I'll, you, I'll say that till I'm dead. You, you've never been a fan of French people dying, uh, which is one of your admirable traits. So I know that that's why this scene oh. really got to you. Well, I mean, no more than anyone else, certainly. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, I don't mind a Frenchy. Uh, hit, hit the old headstone, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I didn't like no, the... No, I'm, not, I'm not done talking about this, sir. Yeah. You, 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 didn't, you, you didn't let me finish. Uh, uh, Please, Jim, go ahead. I, I killed Germans, too, you know. I killed a few Germans. But, uh, I, I would hope you killed more, uh, Jim. Yeah, every, for every, uh, you know, for every German, I killed ten Frenchmen uh, and, and three French ladies. But I, I just got to say, the death rattle's just not the same. It's, it's really not the same. Jim, did you get an iron cross during the war? Yeah, uh, they gave me a cross. They said it was steel, but now, now I think it was maybe made of iron. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're mad about that because you love nickel. I do love nickel. I, Harvey? <laughs> oh, he sees, he's seeing the rabbit again, guys. Yeah. Uh, what do I got here? Oh, I, I like the, the little uh, detail when he goes home. He's walking through the streets and there's like a vegetable market set up and the tables have very tiny piles of vegetables on them mm-hmm. uh, with very tiny vegetables, very under under ripe vegetables, I suppose. Uh, but again, showing the situation that Germany was in, which was not good. Uh, when, when somebody in the movie says our bread's full of sawdust and that was literally true. They used sawdust and bread during the war to help fill it out. Don't knock it till you try it. Uh, the last thing I have is just, just to reiterate, I, I kind of, I don't like that Himmelstoss was killed off screen. I wish I'd gotten a little more closure with him on that. Um, but like I say, I, I thought he was, was, was not done quite as dirty as the book and the, and the first film. And normally that's not something that I would be cool with, but I, I feel like Himmelstoss gets, uh, gets a little too much shit. So good on him for earning his cross in this movie. Okay. There we go. Well, Jason, I don't have a whole lot of trivia here. This is a, a 1979 TV movie that didn't make a, a huge cultural impact other than, I mean, it's known as being, you know, a, another version of All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, certainly, there is a, is there a video on IMDb outlining the uh, the difference between all three versions? Sure. There sure is, and there I watched be. it. There must be. There, oh, you did. Yeah, it was it was very brief, but <laughs> it was something. Okay. Um, just interesting that they they noted they recognize the 1979 version um, as one of the definitive versions. Um, anyway, this movie was actually filmed in Soviet occupied Czechoslovakia, one of the first U.S. or U.K. productions to be shot in a communist country. Um, <laughs> the other thing, the only other thing I want to mention is that uh, the part of Himmelstoss was almost. Uh, played by Tom Courtney. Huh. Yeah, our old pal Tom Courtney. I don't Courtney. know, man. I mean, I know, like, we, I guess by that point, he probably would have been old enough to do it. Yeah, this is, it I wasn't mean, too far out from the, from the dresser. I mean, yeah, this was after Long Distance Runner, but before the dresser. Yeah. So he was, you know, he was getting, he was getting there. He was getting there. That could have been okay. I mean, when we, and obviously uh, playing, was it uh, Stromakoff? Mm-hmm. He, he showed that he could be villainous, certainly. And that was about 15 years before this, so he probably would have been like in his early 40s, maybe. And that's really all I have. I mean, the reviews for this movie, honestly, if you go on Rotten Tomatoes, they're pretty friggin' positive because 100% of critics liked it. Um, it seems to be uh, pretty pretty much across the board. It actually um, uh, won a Golden Globe for Best Motion Picture Made for TV, and an Emmy Award for Outstanding Film Editing for a Limited Series or Special. Obviously, it's a TV movie, so it did not uh, go mm. to the Oscars or the BAFTAs, but that is uh, still pretty impressive. November 14th, Brendan, 1979. was the date it aired on CBS from 8 to 11 o'clock. Thank you, TV Guide. 
<laughs> Look, if we're going to talk about TV shit, we should talk about when it aired. I mean, because, you know, TV's TV, man. And that's the thing that's interesting about this, because, yeah, this was in that golden age of TV when networks would spend money on, like, big, big, you know, miniseries level event TV, like Shogun and shit. Or, like, like, uh, like in in, uh, in the UK, like, the day after and stuff like that. Yeah, I, Wait, is absolutely. that the UK? No, that's the US. Yep. No, that was, uh, uh, or are you thinking of Threads? Maybe I'm thinking of Threads. Yeah, Threads is the UK Threads is one. definitely the UK Day one, after yeah. is America. Nuclear war, bad shit, you know? Yeah. But then even like stuff like the, 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 <laughs> I don't know. I want to say the fabulous Thornbirds, but that's not the name the of the book. The <laughs> Thornberries? The cartoon? No, no, no. It's a, the Thornbirds. It was a, it was a, it was like a novel and then it was a big time TV miniseries. The fabulous Baker Boys. No, uh, the Wonder Boys, Wonder mm, Woman. No, it's, it was it was something Thornbirds. The boys, the, the famous Thorn. I don't know. Boy George, I don't care. Okay, that makes two of us. <laughs> um, all right. Well, there you go. That's that's our talk on the movie. Now, Jason, I, we kind of got an idea of where we're at, but uh, why don't you uh, why don't you tell us anyway why you felt this was a superior version of the source material and why you think this should replace the 1930 version on the list? And go. Uh, Brendan, I'm not going to lie. I don't lie. This is a competently made movie that has no real reason to exist. And I don't know that the next one will either. Maybe it'll do something more interesting, but like it doesn't do anything particularly unique. But all credit goes to the production because, you know, for TV production, it's extremely well made. I love Ernie in the movie, even if he's maybe miscast. I love seeing Ian Holm playing my man Himmelstoss. But I mean, fuck, if you had to choose, go watch the 1930 movie. Just do it. This gets um, four out of seven bayonets. Okay. Um, I think I'm a little bit higher on it. I don't. I mean, I don't think it's like a on a, like a classic or anything, but I think it's a, a solid piece of filmmaking, especially for you know a late '70s TV movie um, adaptation of a, the book, when which already got you a absolute classic 1930 film but um yeah. yeah it's i think it's pretty good it's got to, it's got some decent performances in it i think uh i, th- I we talk about ian holm i think ian holm is wonderful in it i think the lead is pretty good even jason jason and i will disagree but i think richard thomas is pretty good in this movie um and yeah it's fine like obviously if you had to choose watch the original of course but if you you know if you see this on it, it's pretty good too but let me make it clear. This is a a competently made, well, you hate man, it. compelling enough, compelling enough movie. Like I didn't, like I've watched a lot of movies where I've you know been very bored and painfully been getting my way through them, and it was not the case in this one. I I did like it was paced well enough, and and I enjoyed it. But I mean, on the remake scale, this is not. Don't confuse this with like the Doctor Zhivago well, remake. Is what I'm hold saying. On. Like Jason, why are you pissing on Delbert Mann's grave right now? I had to pee and it happened to be here. Like, it's not nothing personal to the guy. It's just, if, if I see a grave and I got to pee, what do you think I'm going to do? What would any person do? Oh, I, I don't know. This is a weird line of thinking. Hmm. You know, it's a weirder line of thinking, Brendan. Did you know that on the same day that, um, that uh, this uh, series aired, also that day at four in the afternoon, ABC's after school special is being expanded from one hour to 90 minutes for the first time in its six year run in 1979. Uh, 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 it was the uh, the story, the late great me story of a teenage alcoholic. Fascinating. <laughs> Brendan, Jerry is 15 years oh, old. Boy. She is attractive and a good student, but is also terribly insecure I, about herself I'm not physically a, and socially. I'm not a huge Dave, fan of how it's New in town, attractive. courts Jerry and urges her to sample some wine. The cycle begins. More and more dependent on alcohol, Jerry begins falling apart. Her parents refuse to recognize the truth. Only a teacher who herself, a non-drinking alcoholic, insists on offering help. And what is the lesson in all this, Brendan, is that if you're going to go to war, you got to avoid booze because you will come back a terrible alcoholic and you will do terrible things to teenage girls. Brendan, back over to you. Uh, horrifying. That was pretty progressive that they called a, a Lady Jerry, I guess. G-E-R-I, much like in the same vein as Jerry Hallowell, of course, late of the Spice My Girls. favorite Beetle. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, well, there you go. Uh, so that's all quite on the Western Front, nineteen seventy nine. But Jason, um, okay. So should we just lie and say we're going to? Th- I guess it's streaming now, so we'll just say it's streaming. Next week, 
we are going to do, uh, we're still not going back to the list, but we're going to do something a little bit different, I guess. So we, we kind of mm. did this before with uh, Napoleon, but we're going to watch a very, very new movie. Um, we are going to watch, as I as I mentioned in a previous episode, we are going to watch one of the best picture Oscar nominees. And in fact, by this point, the Oscars may have already aired, in fact, so I don't, it may be a best picture winner. I don't know. Um, it may be, but we're going to talk about, uh, because we talked about sexy beast in the past, and we've also talked about under the skin. We are going to talk about Jonathan Glazer's new movie, the zone of Ooh. interest as a movie that Ooh. is, uh, gaining the attention of many a critic, uh, getting rave reviews across the board. Um, it will probably not be a super pleasant thing to watch. Um, no, the commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Haas and his wife Hedwig strive to build a dream life for their family in a house and garden next to the camp. Um, so yeah, we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at that interesting um, arrangement of situations. Who is uh, playing Haas? So this is an all um, this is an all German cast, so I'm not I'm not quite oh. sure. Christian Friedel. But I, the I'm name not, does sound vaguely familiar. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I, I'm looking at his filmography, Jason. You don't know who he is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know who he is either. Um, but we do have Sandra H- Sandra Hewler, who was really good in Anatomy of a Fall, another movie that came out this year. Hewler, <sighs> you're such a basic bitch. <laughs> um, yes, I am. So, Zone of Interest. Next week, we're going to talk about it. It's a new movie, uh, so check that out. You can uh, it's, ju- it's just started streaming, so it should be out there if anyone wants to watch it, watch it beforehand and, uh, and share your thoughts with us, share your minds, share your visions for the future, share your wisdom, share your wares. Jason, um, we're on the Internet. We're, we're all yeah. over social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Blue Sky at FSAC Pod, as in for screen and contra podcast. If you want to find us on another podcast app, we're on there. We're on pretty much all of them. But if you want to go to our home base and get the full list um, of other you know podcast platforms that we are on, you can go to ageofradio.org slash for screen and contra. Jason. Where are you at on the Twitters and the Blue Skis? At Jason D. McLeod, that is M-A-C-L-E-O-D. If you're on either of those platforms, that will take you to me. Follow Jason for the hottest tips on how to survive trench warfare. Well, number one, don't don't build don't build and live in a trench. <laughs> that's the kind of classic material you're gonna get if you follow Jason D. McLeod. That's <laughs> M-A-C-L-E-O-D on Twitter. Thanks, Brandon. No problem. I'm always putting over your brand. Thanks, brother. And that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, so, it is, isn't it? Yeah. So, Jason, I guess um, I guess I'll just address you at this moment, Thank you. Um, and I will uh, admonish you and admire you because I'm of both minds. And uh, I look to you and I say to you, Jason McLeod, my co-host, God save the king. And you know what? While you're at it, God save the musician Sting. I know the wrestler Sting got a big shout out from you last week, but I think the musician Sting deserves a shout out too. So God bless Sting. And for Screen and Country, I'm Brendan. And I'm Jason. Don't stand so, don't stand so, don't stand so close to me. Woo! I combined them. For Screen and Country was created by and stars Brendan Wall and Jason McLeod. Today's film was the 1979 television adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remark. British Grenadiers Kiwi Mix served as this week's music. This has been an Age of Radio production, copyright 2024.